Uh, 50 years ago, this year, I went to the cinema to see a new movie. Get Carter, directed by Michael Hodges, his first film. I think about the only one that ever actually got him any acclaim. And the film was filmed and set in Newcastle. Now Newcastle has a quite a long history uh, as a film setting payroll. I remember in the 19, I think 1960 was one of the first. But Newcastle wasn't necessarily where the author of Get Carter, Ted Lewis, had intended his work to be set. The book was published in 1970, a year before the, the movie itself, and it was, it was Lewis's second successful novel. He had quite, uh, he had quite a track record of writing successful criminal novels. British noir. He was a kind of local homebred successor to Raymond Chandler. But Lewis had nothing to do with Newcastle. He was born in 1940 in Manchester, and the family moved at quite a young age to Humberside. He studied art at Humberside College, where he was taught by Henry Treese himself, a prolific novelist. And Treese possibly influenced Lewis in starting to write. He worked in the ad industry, advertising industry, and then really his great period of productivity was between 1965 and his death in 1980, in which time he wrote nine successful novels, of which by far the most famous is Jack's Return Home. This was filmed as Get Carter. But the novel isn't actually set, as I mentioned, in Newcastle. It's set probably in Scunthorpe, a very long way from Newcastle. It was only when the director and producer were scouting for locations in 1970 that they chanced upon Newcastle. And I remember Mike Hodges describing the place as having a great deal of squalid grandeur. That annoyed quite a lot of us actually because we thought Newcastle was alright. But what is remarkable, looking 50 years on, is how many of the iconic locations, locations that became totemic as a result of the film, have now disappeared. Of course the famous Get Carter car park in Gateshead is no more, though I believe you can still buy chunks of it, like the, like the Berlin Wall, uh, which means it's probably a very, very large car park. And here I'm standing on the High Level Bridge, which again features in the film, which we'll come to in a moment. But there's something else about Newcastle in 1970 that attracted the filmmakers. And this was Newcastle's perceived role as a centre for organised crime, OCGs, as I think you'd probably call it on line of duty. In 1967, two slot, slot machine, one-armed bandit kings, Dennis Stafford and Michael Lavaglio, were uh, were convicted of murdering their associate, Angus Sibbett, who was found shot to death in the back of his Jaguar motor car. Jags were the preferred cars of villains, both in movies and in reality. This lifted the lid on a rather squalid subculture of local organised crime based on prostitution, pornography and of course um, fiddling slot machines. And that was one of the reasons why Hodges decided that Newcastle was the perfect location. Filming took eight months altogether, the whole process and 40 days location shooting took place in Newcastle. The movie starred Michael Caine, of course, who definitely does not come from Newcastle, an East End boy. Also Britt Eklund, John Osborne and Ian Henry. And introduced a very young Alan Armstrong as Keith, who was the mate of Jack's deceased brother Frank. The plot sticks sort of to the book, but does vary it from time to time. Now, in both the book and the film, Jack is working for East End gangsters Gerald and Sid Fletcher. And at the same time, Jack is having a clandestine affair with Gerald's mistress, Anna, played by Britt Eklund. He's planning to run away with her and start a new life and a new perfidious career in South Africa, working for a local gangster called Stein. However, he hears that his estranged brother has died in a drunk driving accident. Now, right from the start, Jack is alerted to the fact that this can't be right because he knows his brother Frank never drank and always drove very carefully. When he sees Frank's car dragged out of the river, and one of the Riverside scrapyards, he realises that the car has undoubtedly been tampered with and that Frank's death was certainly no accident. So he comes north to begin to ask questions. On the train north, he sits next to a stranger, a man who has a particularly distinctive ring. There's no particular reason for this, but this individual will reappear significantly later in the film. He's not in the book. 
Now, Jack left Newcastle when he was a young man, when he was a young tearaway. He's never been back. It has nothing but bad memories. There's no nostalgia here. He's gone down to the bright lights of the West End gangsters, the Crays, and all of the other crime families, and made a great deal of money. He's utterly ruthless, totally savage, and doesn't have much in the way of redeeming features. One of the reasons why the character uh, drew rather cautious critical acclaim because it is an essentially a dark film. This is British noir. Now, those of us who arrive in this 70s might remember the long bars, of course. Uh, only one of which I think the Crown Posada now exists. But Ted Lewis tells us how Jack arrives in Newcastle as he gets a lift from a taxi driver. How much is that? I said. Five bob, he said. Here you are, I said. I gave him seven and six. Thanks, mate, he said. All the best. He made to take my bag towards the hotel. That's all right, I said. I can manage. He gave me the bag. I began to turn away. Uh, he said, if you're off to be about during the next few days and you need out, driving anywhere like, kiss a ring, right? I turned to look at him. The blue of the neon and the dead yellow of his high street light made him look as though he needed an oxygen tent. There was an earnest, helpful look on his face. Rain looked like sweat on his forehead. I kept looking at him. The earnest, helpful look changed. I told you, I said, I can manage. He looked at the hold all, then at me, tracing back my words. He tried to frown, but a little bit of fear made him look more hurt than angry. I was only being helpful, he said. I smiled at him. Good night, I said, and turned away. I walked towards the dark door marked saloon and opened it. I didn't hear him close his. Amateurs, I thought. Bloody stinking amateurs. I closed the door behind me. You had to give the landlord credit. He really tried to make it look the kind of place married couples in their forties would like to come to for the last hour on a Saturday night. There was that heavy wallpaper in panels, the relief stuff that tried to look like it looked as though it was velvet. There was a photo mural of Capri. There were war seats in leatherette that looked as though they'd been put in a couple of years ago. There was Formica and all the tabletops, and also on top of the bar. There was some plastic raw iron creating a pointless division. There was also a clean shirt on the landlord. Now, Jack, of course, has to attend the funeral. Before he goes to the funeral, he meets his teenage niece, Dory. Now, there's a bit of a history with Dory, or particularly with her mother, and it might well be the case that Dory is actually Jack's daughter and not Frank's. But Jack's the black sheep of an otherwise grey family, and Frank never let him have anything to do with Dory, whom he suspects is indeed Jack's daughter. Jack also meets Margaret, who is Frank's girlfriend, or sort of girlfriend. He's not too sure about Margaret either. And obviously, it's very awkward between him and his niece because he doesn't know what to say to her. And the funeral, which is only attended by Keith as well as an additional mourner, is a pretty, pretty grim affair. We left the church and got into the car again. Dorian and I got into the back and the vicar got in next to the driver. We drove along back streets. At one point, an old josser on a bike just as old gave us right away at a junction and slowly and gravely raised his hat. After a bit, the vicar leant his arm on the back of his seat and looking round him said you'll see some changes in the town since you've been away mr carter a few i said yes he said things are changing but not quickly enough to my mind one day though all this will be gone and then thank heaven people have somewhere decent decent to live and bring up their children somewhere they'll want to go home to instead of the street i said always assuming that what they replace it with will be better. Oh, he said, oh, but it must be. It's bound to be. Is it? I said. I looked at him. He had sandy hair and glasses and a yellow face. It was impossible to tell how old he was. We rolled down the hill to the cemetery. The day was bright and windy, and low, grey, fluffy clouds raced across the thin sun. After the funeral, Jack goes looking for Albert, 
Albert was one of his own contacts, who he knows hangs out at the race course. Albert sees him at the race course and does a runner. But Jack at the races also sees another old acquaintance, Eric. Now Eric, of course, is a gangster. Eric is wearing his grey chauffeur suit and dark sunglasses, played by Ian Hendry. Jack and Eric have a tense exchange. Jack senses that Eric knows something about his brother's death. When they part, Jack follows Eric, follows him in his car, and Eric drives out to the country estate of Mr. Kinnear. Now, Mr. Kinnear, played by John Osborne, is the local Mr. Big, a serious gangster, who Jack suspects has links with the Fletchers in London. He's not wrong. Jack gate crashes one of Kinnear's poker parties where he attempts to get some information out of Kinnear, but Kinnear is sly and subtle and tells him nothing. He also meets uh, whom he assumes, one whom he assumes to be Kinnear's girlfriend or one of his string of mistresses, Glenda, who's very glamorous but also completely drunk. As he's leaving, Eric sidles up to Jack and warns him not to get between the Kinnears and the Fletchers and that he's getting into rather hot water. Jack returns to his lodgings, where a bunch of heavies try to persuade him by forcible means to return to London. He decides not to. He gets the better of the heavies and captures the middleman who's been sent to take the message. He terrifies him, watched by a horrified Keith, into giving him a name. Giving him a name, and that name is Cliff Brumby. Now, here there are echoes of Stafford and Vaglio, because Brumby owns slot machines and amusement arcades, big business in the 60s. He's a wealthy and successful man, exists kind of on the margins of the dark side. Jack drives out to Brumby's house where his teenage daughter's having a riotous party. He accosts Brumby, but it turns out quite obviously Brumby has no idea who he is, has no idea what he's about, and Jack realises he's obviously been set up. So he decides then to question Margaret. Margaret, so what was going on between you, you and Frank? He was alright and me. Alright, but just another bloke really. Nicer than most. Yeah, but still just another bloke. Yeah. Nicer than most though. I can't help the way I am. So, how often did you see him? Once a week. It's pretty regular. Well, he was gentlemanly. Ah, I like that. So once a week you like a gentleman? Why all the needle? Because, Margaret, I know you're lying. What was going on? What well, was actually going on with Frank? He wanted me to leave Dave and he wanted to, to marry him. He said he'd kill himself. I was frightened what you might do. You're a lying cow, Margaret. Look, Frank wasn't like that. I'm the villain in the family, remember? So I want to know who killed him. I don't know nothing. Ah. At this point, Jack has company again. The Fletchers, alarmed at what Jack might uncover, have sent two of his associates, Con McCarthy and Peter the Dutchman, played by George Sewell and Tony Beckley, to drag Jack back by force. He gets the better of them and eludes them. But at this point, they've been telling Margaret and they catch up with Jack. However, Glenda roars in in a white sports car and spirits Jack off to a meeting in the iconic Get Carter car park, unfortunately no longer with us, where again he meets Brumby. Now, Brumby is a bit more forthcoming this time. He's planning a restaurant, because there was actually a restaurant in the, the car park when it existed. And it's the fact is the Get Carter car park meant it had several stages of execution when it was due for demolition. Brumby tells Jack that Kinnear is trying to take over his business, trying to muscle in, and that he believes Kinnear was responsible for the death of Frank. He offers Jack £5,000, a lot of money in those days, to kill Kinnear. And Jack at that point refuses. Jack goes back with Glenda. He goes back to her flat, a luxury apartment flat provided presumably either by Brumby or Kinnear or jointly funded by both. They, they have sex. When Glenda goes in the bath however, she leaves running what turns out to be a pornographic film. Jack watches the film, more at idleness than anything else, but then he becomes riveted and horrified for his niece, possibly daughter, Doreen, is in the film, where she's forced to have sex with Albert. Glenda and Margaret are both also in the film. 
Jack goes through to Glenda. I should give you an Oscar. You've seen the film then? Who was the young girl then? I don't know. Did Albert pull her? I don't know. Nah, not Albert's style. How about Eric? Did Eric pull her? How should I know? You're a lying cow! Glenda, you know exactly what was going on. What was her name? Do you know what her name was? I think the girl's name was Doreen. That's right. That's right, Glenda. Doreen. Doreen Carter. That's my name. Jack then forces Glenda's head down into the bath, almost uh, drowning her, to extract the information that he requires. And what he finds out is that indeed Kinnear was behind the film and Eric was the fixer. He was the man who pulled Doreen and recruited both Glenda and Margaret, who were regulars in Kinnear's sex films. Jack decides to confront Brumby and he locks Glenda in the boot of her car and roars off back to the car park. Now, in the car park, he accuses Brumby of being behind the film. Brumby denies it. He, of course, blames Kinnear. But he admits that it was he, Brumby, who showed Jack's brother Frank the film, hoping that Frank would inform the police and that they would then uh, take action against Kinnear, even though he has many of the police on his payroll. The problem was, Eric and his heavies got to Frank before he could speak to the police, and it was Eric and Kinnear's men who arranged Frank's death. Now in the movie, at this point, Jack beats up Cliff and throws him off the top of the iconic car park. Actually, in the book, that doesn't happen. In the book, Brumby gets away because he still thinks that Jack is going to kill Kinnear on his behalf. Look, Cliff, I said, stop wasting your money on insurance. I don't want you. I've told you. Just a deal as before. Brumby, Brumby breathed in and took out the two bundles of very new notes and put them on the table. I didn't touch them. Brumby looked at me. And the rest, I said. Brumby carried on looking at me, but his expression didn't change. Eventually, he slid his hand into the briefcase and laid two more bundles of the same size on the table. I smiled at him. Never sell yourself short, Cliff, I said. After all, it's your life. You've only got the one. Gradually, he relaxed and let himself give some sort of a smile. So, he said, where's Kinnear's place? Near Sowerby. He's got an estate. It's off the Doncaster Road. I know, you go through Malton. When will you do it? Tonight? Maybe? Kinnear's got a party on. A weekend do. It's supposed to look like a house party, except it's not. Glenda's going. A few foreign clients, a few interesting diversions laid on. Down in the basement, like. Uh, he's got it all kitted out down there. I can imagine. Perhaps that's where Glenda is now, he said, looking at me. Perhaps. He looked away. Well, he said, we may as well have a drink on it. May as well. Brumby poured the scotch we drank. To Kinnear, I said. Brumby poured some more. What will you do, he said. Let me know. Maybe. It depends. On what? Things. We drank again. Brumby poured himself another. Very large. Not for me, I said. I stood up, and Brumby finished his drink and stood up too. Anyway, he said, I suppose you'll know soon enough. Suppose you will. He clicked the briefcase shut and picked it up. I picked up the money and shoved it in my pockets. Brumby shrugged his overcoat close around him and walked into the hall. The projector was still going full belt. But I shut it off, I said. Brumby was standing by the open door. I joined him and we went out into the grey day. Brumby closed the door behind us. There was no one else about. We walked towards the lift. The misty rain was dense enough to practically obscure the neighbouring blocks. Only dull light spreading soft at the edges were evidence of the other flats. As we walked along the balcony, Brumley was talking to me about how glad he was everything had finally worked out all right. How he'd been a bit worried about telling me what he knew, etc, etc. The cold air and the warm scotch had made him a bit light-headed. He was like a man talking to himself. We stopped outside the lift. I pressed the button somewhere down below. Door slits too. Now, at this point in the book, Jack is planning to kill Brumby, but Brumby manages to, in fact, make good his escape. 
Jack is now finding himself once again pursued by the two heavies who've been joined by Eric, clear evidence that the Fletchers and the and Kinnear are in cahoots. Worst of all, Eric has found out about Carter's relationship with Anna, Gerald Fletcher's girlfriend. They'll deal with her in London. He knows he can now never go back. So he has £5,000 money from uh, Brumby. He just now has to finish off the business, the business being Kinnear. The heavies and Eric pursue Jack onto the Tyne Ferry, where there is a shootout on board the boat. In the course of the gunfight, Jack kills uh, Peter the Dutchman, who's a, a rather some pleasant sadistic character, but the other two, Con and Eric, escape. As they escape, they back their Land Rover up against the white TR6, I think it is, which has Glenda in the boot. They don't know she's in the boot, not that they would care, and they push the car into the river. Your motor, says Con, and off they go. But of course, Jack probably hasn't seen the last of them. He just now has to pull all the ends together, the loose ends together, join them up, and deal with Kinnear. Now then, Jack has to set this account with Kinnear before he disappears to South Africa, and he thinks he'll take Doreen with him, and actually adopt her, effectively, as his daughter. So he telephones Kinnear. Kinnear's in the middle of this riotous party, and offers to give him back the film, the uh, pornographic film, which, of course, uh, would be enough to land Kinnear in jail, if he'll sacrifice Eric. So it's a trade, the film for Eric. Kinnear has no hesitation in sacrificing his subordinate and agrees he will send Eric to a specified location, as it happens, firstly Dunstan Staithes and then Blythe Beach, where the coal grabs were still working in 1970. But both parties have an insurance. In fact, Jack actually posts the film to the Vice Squad in London, knowing they're not corrupt, at least not as corrupt as the Northern Police are in relation to Kinnear, and that this could bring him and the Fletchers tumbling down. Kinnear too has an insurance. He telephones a hitman to deal with Jack after he has dealt with Eric to tie up all the loose ends. Now we've seen this assassin before. He's the man that Jack sits next to on the train during that wonderful opening title sequence with a thumping score by Roy Budd. Jack has a surprise, however, for Kinnear. He kidnaps Margaret at knife point and takes her to Kinnear's estate, where this party's in full swing. And then he kills her. So here they are at Kinnear's estate. And I'm afraid it's goodbye, Margaret. Ugh. He leaves the body there to be found as further incriminating evidence on Kinnear. Now, Eric, he meets on the beach. And in the film, he beats Eric to death with a shotgun. And then as he's about to throw the incriminating shotgun away into the sea, the marksman shoots Jack clean between the eyes. And that's the end of the film. It's not the end of the book, though. In the book, the book has a very different ending, and one which actually leaves scope for Jack possibly, just possibly, to survive, as indeed he appears in two uh, sequels. Eric stops crawling, his head jerks about from side to side, trying to see where my voice is coming from. Over here, I say. I'm up here, Eric. This time he freezes. When he finally managed to move again, his head swivels slowly round till he's looking at me. The movement is like that of a lizard on a warm rock. Get up, I say. He gets up. He doesn't take his eyes off my face. Down, I say. He doesn't move. I show him Con's shooter. I said down. He walks to the edge of the kiln and slithers down into its eroded, overgrown side. Lean against the kiln, they're back to me. He stretches his arms out and does as he's told. There's nothing else he can do. I climb down from the kiln and stand and look at Eric for a minute or two. Then I ease myself up to the edge of the vat next to the shotgun and the bottle. Turn round, I say. He turns round. I look into his face and smile. You look as though you could use a drink, I say. He sways slightly and tries to straighten up again, but he can't quite make the true vertical again. So why don't you join me? After all, you are a drinking mate of my brother, weren't you? A skin of geese flies over from the river. Come here, I say. He seems to have difficulty in putting one foot in front of the other. When he finally gets to me, I pick up the bottle. Let's have this one with Frank, I say. He doesn't move. Take it, 
I said. Somehow, he managed to stretch out an arm and take the bottle. I look into his eyes until he forces himself to lift the bottle to his mouth. He tips the bottle and opens his mouth, but because he's trying not to swallow, the whiskey runs out the sides of his mouth and down his neck and chin. Swallow it, Eric, I say. Every drop, just like it was with Frank. He puts the bottle to his mouth again and takes a sip, and then another. And a third time, I put my hand to the base of the bottle and hold it, tilted, so he's either got a drink or choke. This is where I'm very, very wrong. I have one hand on the bottle, and my other hand is gripping the inside edge of the vat to stop me falling forward as I tilt the bottle. I am wide open. The movement is very slight. I'm concentrating on his face, and it isn't until I hear the thin click that those things have I know what's happening. For a split second, there is unbelievable coolness. The bottle smacks on the edge of the vat. Then the heat comes and pain climbs inside me. As the blade leaves me, I fall sideways along the edge of the vat. Eric lunges to the shotgun, but as I roll over, I catch the stock with my foot, and the gun slides off the rim and clatters down inside the vat. I continue rolling, and for a moment, I am staring up into the sky and it is red. Then I fall. I land on my back, my torso on a pile of bricks, my legs in a few inches of water. Eric then decides to finish Jack off, not with a knife, which would be smart, but by using the shotgun, Jack's own shotgun. As he levels and takes aim and tries to pull the trigger, the old gun, which hasn't been fired for years, misfires and bursts, killing Eric, leaving Jack badly injured lying in several inches of water in the old vat. And that's where the book actually ends. That's where we leave Jack. Doesn't look too good for him, but he's not dead. And it certainly works out that Lewis decides to resurrect Jack for two more sequels. Ted Lewis himself uh, died at the very early age of 42 in 1982 from alcohol-related uh, illness. When the film was first released in 1971, it met with mixed critical acclaim and mixed success at the box office. But in the over-intervening half century, it has become iconic, one of the defining motion pictures to be filmed on Tyneside, and still holds that high status even today. And of course now, as we read the book, as we tour the few sites that are left from the film, we're keeping that memory alive. Get Carter Heritage.